I mean, let's talk about that deposition, Melissa. It was played at the trial, including a moment he mistook Carol for one of his ex-wives in a photograph. There was also what you just heard there, the sort of fortunately or unfortunately that's been the case. How does that tape then factor in as evidence? Well, again, it goes to this whole question of whether the allegations against him that E.G. Carroll has made are actually true or more likely to be true than not. And it seems from that deposition, this is someone who can't pick out E.G. and Carroll from his former wife, who can't decide whether or not it's fortunately or unfortunately that women are sexually abused or harassed. And it's not great evidence in a situation where you have a civil standard where individuals just have to determine whether you are more likely to have committed this or not. Andy, let's turn to the January 6th investigation. Proud Boys leader Enrique Tarillo, convicted of seditious conspiracy for helping mobilize the insurrection, even though he wasn't present when it happened. I'll elaborate for me on what you think this verdict means for Trump. Well, we don't know yet, but we do know that with seditious conspiracy, the government is basically saying that the Proud Boys are a terrorist cell. And the fact that they had guilty verdicts come back means that their connections to Trump, and they have very close connections, uh, means that he is in bed with a terrorist cell. And so going forward, it'll be interesting to see uh, whether the DOJ uses the Proud Boys verdict to show that he was really ingrained in the January 6th insurrection. I mean, Melissa, if you're Jack Smith, what do, you, what do these convictions mean to you? I mean, these are huge, I think, for Jack Smith. Um, whether they're huge in the broader scheme of things, I think, is another matter. I mean, these are sort of rear-end efforts to deal with domestic terrorism. We know that domestic extremism is on the rise, and we don't really have any ways of addressing that at the front end. So, you know, there's a lot that these convictions can do for other cases. But the broader question of preventing this, I'm not sure that this does prevent future domestic extremism and terrorism. Right. Andy, I want you to speak to that point, because what I have heard from intel experts is that these groups have actually just become more disparate. It's become harder for uh, security groups, for intel groups to track them. They're now showing Going up at abortion clinics, at health care centers. They are not going away. And the Proud Boys are the perfect example of that because despite their leaders being behind bars, none of the January 6th prosecutions have had any chilling effect on our extremist crisis at large. The Proud Boys are mobilizing at a more rapid clip than before. They're just not taking as many cues from Trump, but they're still mobilizing on the GOP's grievances and I think what we've seen is that you can't prosecute your way out of an extremist crisis. I mean, he here's the reason that I wanted you in this conversation, Jamal, which is we can sit here and we can talk about the E. Jean Carroll case. We can talk about 1-6. We can talk about the affiliation with far-right extremists. And that, to us, paints one picture. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, there was a poll released today by ABC News, Washington Post, uh, showing Trump having an advantage over President Biden despite his legal woes, threats to democracy, everything else. I mean, as an operative, help me make sense of those numbers. Listen, there are a group of people in the country who will vote for Donald Trump for, no, for whatever the reason. Now, some of them are people who fundamentally believe in his view of the government and his insurrectionist views and his belief of, you know, white supremacy, whatever it is you want to call it. Then there are some people, they just wear red jerseys. And so they're going to vote for the person, mm -hmm. the guy who's wearing the red jersey, the Republican in the race. And so we got to see that this race for the presidency is going to be 47, 48 percent probably floor for Donald Trump, right? So the question that keeps coming back to me as somebody who just left the White House, we all swear an oath to protect and defend the Constitution when you go work for the government. Nobody does that more than the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. The idea that you have somebody at the top of the United States government who is willing to overturn everything about the way we, our laws, our customs, and our morals about the government is something that, to me, ought to just frighten everybody. I just don't know if there are enough people in the country um, who can get below that floor for Donald Trump of 47, 48 percent. Andy, before I let you go, about 30 seconds left. This is an ongoing relationship between these far right groups and the current GOP. It is a relationship that is only growing. Mm -hmm. The media, right-wing media, law enforcement, and politicians have never rebuffed their fascist foot soldiers in the street, and therefore they're only growing. They feel they have that tacit and explicit endorsement from the GOP, and so they're only moving forward with or without Trump, and so it's going to take the GOP to pull those soldiers out of the street themselves, and so far we haven't seen any of that.